Tom Ford meteoric rise at the house of Gucci had been one of the great success stories of the decade. Since the 1930s, Gucci has been known for their signature loafers and leather bags. But by the 1980s, the designs were stuffy and bordering on gaudy, and the Gucci empire was crumbling. Ford came on board in 1990 as a then unknown designer from Perry Ellis, just as Gucci was on the verge of bankruptcy. Since taking over as creative director, his modernized retro designs have single-handedly doubled the company's stock and generate sales of over $1 billion a year, making it the driving force in fashion today. I am pleased to have Tom Ford on this broadcast for a look at his career and what is happening in the world of fashion. Welcome to the program. Thank you. I'm it's great to, to have here. you here. Thank We've you. It's great to be here. wanted to do this for a while. Thank you. I've wanted to do it for a while. <laughs> well, this would work out just fine. Uh, tell me where Gucci is in terms of you've just acquired Yves Saint Laurent. We have. You know, the haute, haute couture is going to sort of stay over haute there. Haute couture has stayed, um, <clears throat> excuse me, haute couture stayed a, a part of another company called Artemis, which is mm -hmm. held by Francois Pinault. Mm -hmm. So that's a, a separate company at this point. And we've acquired. Uh, everything else that really is Yves Saint Laurent. Uh, along with Yves Saint Laurent, there's a big part of the business which is Sanofi Beauté, yeah. uh, which used to be a part of Sanofi, which is a pharmaceuticals company in France. Uh, and they're really two separate businesses. There's the fashion business, and there's Sanofi Beauté, which is a fragrance and cosmetics business, which uh, the sort of primary uh, or most important brand at Sanofi is Yves Saint Laurent. What does this mean for you and for Gucci? What does it mean? It means we've started uh, our multi-brand, uh, started implementing our multi-brand strategy. It was, it's been our goal for uh, really the past few years, although this was sort of uh, accelerated uh, about a year ago, uh, to become a multi-brand luxury goods group. And Saint, uh, Saint Laurent and Sanofi is our first acquisition. We followed uh, right after that, uh, the week right after, with another company called Sergio Rossi, which is a great shoe company, an Italian shoe company. Uh, that, that does quite well and, and we believe has a lot of potential. You led me right where I wanted to go. <laughs> there are those who say that you might want to buy Versace. There are those who say you might want to buy Calvin Klein. You know, you can't believe rumors in this business. It's amazing. You know, <laughs> yeah. you, you, we were just talking before we went on air about Stella McCartney, who's a friend of mine. And, you know, yeah. we've been spotted out a few times. And the next thing you know, Stella McCartney's coming to Gucci. I mean, the fashion business, uh, well, I guess all businesses today, really. You know, it, it's hard to stay out of the press. People watch you so, uh, you know, with a microscope. So there are a lot of rumors uh, around. Okay. We are obviously... Uh, looking at other acquisitions. Uh, we have nothing to announce this moment, and we've made no final decisions on other companies. Okay, so it's a possibility. That's a diplomatic answer. <laughs> yeah, I know. I want to get around. I want to massage the answer a little bit. Right. It's a possibility you could be looking at Calvin Klein. It would fit in the Gucci empire. Uh, you know, we're looking at a lot of things. And Versace would fit in the same category. We're looking at a lot of things. Those that you might be looking at. Looking at a lot of things. You know, what we try to look at when we, when we look for a company, uh, <laughs> we, we, we try to add value. Um, so we look for companies where we believe that our expertise could enhance the value of that company and thus enhance the value of Gucci Group. Uh, and that, that could mean different things. Uh, you know, a company could be uh, lacking, a, you know, could be like Gucci. Yeah. It could be a great name that is sort of sitting, sleeping, uh, and, and needs to be uh, re-energized. Could be a, a place where you have an amazing designer who's doing a great, you know, uh, progressing nicely but needs an infusion of capital and maybe a little bit of direction in terms of stores and merchandising, and, and we can add that. So there are different scenarios uh, and different types of things that we're looking at. All right, let me stay along this line. Uh, so if you acquired Chloe, you'd acquire Stella, and then the idea is this. Stella would come over and do all the designing for Gucci. You are and jumping, then... <laughs> you're jumping way ahead. First of all, Chloe's, you would part, move. First of all, Chloe's part of a big luxury goods group on its own, and right. we're not acquiring Chloe, and we're not, you know, blah, blah, blah. And, but, or, um, or Stella could come to Gucci, and then you could go over to YSL. Well, and... that's the thing about fashion today, you know. It's changed. Designers have been hopping around uh, <laughs> recently, and designers are becoming more and more uh, like actors, in a sense. Uh, and if, if you want a hit, you get the hit designer, and you bring the hit designer here, and right. if that doesn't work, the hit designer goes there. And the stock of the, the, the place where the designer is can rise and fall with, you know, it, it's, it's changing. I mean, the fashion business is changing. How is and, it changing? Well, there are more designers, for example, who are willing and who want to design for uh, a larger house and who don't necessarily want their name on the label. It has been a... You're a perfect example of that. 
And, and it was a decision that I made. Uh, I don't want my name on a label. One day, I want to be able to walk away and say, you know what, this has been wonderful. I loved designing, but I want to go make a movie, or I want to go live in New Mexico and drive a pickup truck and try to be a sculptor, or I don't know. I mean, there are lots of things I, I, I might want to do in my life. Uh, but so what you don't want to do I is don't drive down Sunset tied. Boulevard and look up to a no. bulletin, to a uh, billboard. billboard. There is a picture of you with a product that you had nothing to do. No, I don't, and I don't want to be. I don't want to be tied to that. Also, had I started off on my own five years ago, we would not be, and I would not be where I am today. Because uh, when you're working with a company that already exists, we have a distribution network set up. You know, five years ago, Gucci, we had 168 stores. You change the design, and boom, six months later, it's in 168 stores. If you're just starting as a designer, it takes time to build up that distribution. It takes time to uh, you know, I mean, there are lots of things to consider about that. So you can go quicker, I think, if you're uh, re-energizing an existing house. Okay, I want to stay with you since you've mentioned that idea. Um, also, the brand recogni recognition is already there in the consumer's head. Uh, and that's another thing, that it takes a long time to build up an image in the consumer's mind of recognizing a name and associating uh, things with that name. And, and again, with an existing name, uh, that's quicker and easier to accomplish. I let you slip away with Stella McCartney. Is she going to, you want to work with her? I would, would love you... to slip away with Stella McCartney, as would <laughs> most <laughs> men I know who meet Stella McCartney. Yes. Um, anyway. Would you like to have her working with you? I love Stella. Would she be think, great to run the Gucci design? I think that Stella, first of all, that rumor makes no sense because Stella, as we all know, it does not design in leather or fur, yeah, and Gucci she is a leather house. That's right, right. Well, it's, it's also you could fix part that. of her upbringing. You could you know, fix that. You could she, spend the leather stuff off. We could. Uh, I see you've been talking. <laughs> anyway, um, but Stella, is, Stella has everything, I think, that it takes to make uh, a designer today. I think she's an excellent designer. I think she's got great, sen uh, great style, great uh, sense of style, great taste. Uh, but she also has everything else. She has the drive. She has the will. She has the intelligence. She worries about sales. She thinks about uh, the brand as a brand. Um, she's also got incredible charm. She's beautiful. Uh, all those things are important today. You know, m more and more we're a visual society. And what you look like and how you photograph and what you, uh, how you spin things, and that sounds like a cynical uh, thing to say, uh, is equally important, or not equally, but is part of the part of the thing. The most important thing is still the product. Okay, but some say it is the fact that you understood what you just said that has enabled you, in part, one of the factors that enabled you to turn around Gucci in design. You understood image. You understood story. You understood how I present things, how I relate to the media, mm. the power of television, all of that. Well, you have to. I mean, it is today's world. You have to. And while I said that the most important thing is the product, and that really is true, because you can have all the advertising in the world, you can have all the hype, and when people go to the store, if they try on your pants and they don't look good and they don't fit or they don't like the fabric, they're not going to buy them. But to get them into the store, to get them there, you need the other part of the equation. You need uh, to excite them. And you need, you know, pants are pants. I mean, fashion, you know, one pair of black pants and the other pair of black pants, you know, so you have to make fashion aspirational. You have to make people believe that if they just have those pants, their whole life is going to come together. They're going to get that guy they want. They're going to get that new job. They're going to get, you know, it, it's because, and, and that's just as much as a, a part of the experience. And, and it actually, again, that sounds like a terrible, very calculated thing, but it's not because uh, by creating that image, you have endowed another quality onto that pair of pants or pair of shoes. Uh, that, that really, you know, makes it something else and makes your experience of wearing that thing something else and enhances your life. If it all gives you confidence to <laughs> bring out the, the best in you, that's the word. if it confidence. gives you the confidence to bring out the best in you, that's then the it's word. contributed to your Absolutely. well-being. Absolutely. Right? The business is changing. Part of it is this mm -hmm. power of image that mm -hmm. is a part of it today. Uh, how else is it changing? I mean, is it changing in color? Is it changing in where the designs are coming from? Is it changing in terms of the power of certain kinds of forces? It's changing in every way, and I hope, because it's about to change again. I mean, it changes constantly, fashion. It changes as life changes, and real true changes in fashion 
are linked to changes in life. Otherwise, you know, they don't really mean anything. And life is changing dramatically. I mean, we're on, you know, we were just looking at your cell phone and your Palm Pilot and your two cell phones and your, you know, <laughs> I mean, but don't life do is changing yeah. and we're working more and more at home, more and more from our computer screen, which in the future, I mean, there, there's several ways this could go. A lot of people think fashion might just die because we're just at home. You can be working your underwear and a t-shirt. Who cares who's going to see you? Uh, you know, even if, when we do become all visually linked through uh, teleconferencing, which I use a lot to work now and to design, uh, you know, you're just seeing as much of somebody. But that means that when you go out in the real world, you're almost making a public appearance, just as an actor or an actress would. And you might want to go to different links, you know. So a, a friend of mine who's the, the wife of a, and I, I say this all the time, but it's so true and I thought it made so much sense. A friend of mine who's uh, a wife of a, a Hollywood actor, a very famous actor, said she doesn't need anything anymore but a, you know, jeans, t-shirts, and ball gowns. Because either she's working and she's in jeans and a t-shirt, or she's stepping out somewhere and waving to people and, 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 and smiling and getting out of a car or being photographed or something. Now, you might think, well, yeah, but she's the wife of a, a famous actor. She's an actress in her own right. Um, but real people are becoming more like this. You know, yeah. more and more, even if you're meeting someone on the internet, if you're going to really arrange a meeting, you want to look great. You know, you're not going to go. You're going to make an effort. Uh, so there's so many ways that I, I mean, I don't know how fashion will change in the next 10 years. I, I, you know, it will move and change uh, quickly, more and more quickly. Is it as satisfying for you today as it has been as you've been on this sort of meteoric rise in terms of transforming Gucci and all the things you've had to do there? Mm -hmm. Is it still satisfying? Absolutely. It's more satisfying than ever. And uh, once I really realized that, uh, I mean, that's the key to happiness is loving what you do. And uh, two or three years ago, you know, I, I, uh, well, for the last 10 years of my life, I wanted to be a successful fashion designer. And I wanted to have, you know, a hit show and another hit show and a strong business and blah, 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 and all these things that you want in life. And, uh, and I had them. And I became a little bit depressed for, you know, six months. I thought, well, you know, this is it. This is it. And what am I going to do to sort of get my energy back and to become excited about this again? And it dawned on me one day that I really love what I do and that it's not about money. It's not about, uh, you know, all these other things. It's because I love this. It's something that comes naturally to me. You know, if you leave me alone here long enough, Charlie, I will refinish your table, change the color. <laughs> You're the guy. Yeah, you know, we need You're to, the guy we I'll need. I'll start. I mean, it's just it's just something I do and I love that process. I love that process yeah. whether I, you know, I'm doing it for a company like Gucci or whether I'm doing it in my personal life. It's it's what I love. Yeah. And you may be have been enormously lucky because I've been very of, lucky. Of course what happened at Gucci. Let me just trace your own journey. Yeah. You grew up in Austin, Texas. Mm -hmm then moved to Santa Fe, Santa Mexico, Fe. where I lived yeah, most of my childhood. Yeah. And, uh, and then came to, first went to Hollywood? Well, no, I went to New York. I moved to New York when I was 17. I went to NYU, uh, and I was studying art history. And I dropped out of school because I started making television commercials. Uh, as an actor? As an actor. Well, you know, an actor. Yeah, I was right. doing television commercials. You know, I was <laughs> sort of selling things. Um, and I uh, did that for three or four years. I worked quite a lot and moved to Los Angeles during that period of time and then decided that I didn't want to be an actor, I didn't like it. Uh, I wanted to be on the other side uh, of, the, of whatever the you know, creative right. uh, thing was and went back to school and started studying uh, interior architecture at Parsons, moved back to New York um, and then moved to New York and I mean moved to uh, Paris and went to school uh, for a year and a half in Paris. While I was in Paris I had an internship uh, at Chloe uh, right. actually in the press department and decided that fashion actually was what really interested me. Architecture was way too serious and I was never going to have the patience to wait, you know, two years for a building to be built and, uh, and uh, decided to go into fashion. Moved back to New York and got a job. How'd you get the job? Driving people crazy, you know, <laughs> yes. calling them constantly, calling them, calling them, calling them. I, I put together a book. I, yeah. I didn't have any fashion experience. I drew uh, up a portfolio of things I thought were the right things, targeted people I wanted to work for, and I just called and called, called and called and called and called. And, and, called. and, called. and once and you got a, a call and she said, come on up, and you were in the lobby and you were up in two seconds. Kathy Hardwick. Kathy I see Hardwick. you've been talking yeah. to Kathy, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and that worked out. It did. And then you went to Perry Ellis. Uh, yeah, I was at Kathy Hardwick uh, for about two years, and then I went to Perry Ellis, and I was there, I think, for about two years as well. It's hard to remember now. And then uh, moved to Italy and started working at Gucci. I realized that I wanted to move to Europe because at that time, fashion wasn't as global as it has become now. It was and centered in Europe? Well, 
It is still, yeah. to a certain extent, centered in Europe, although less and less so, and really becoming more and more global. But I realized that I didn't think it would be any harder to make it as a fashion designer in Europe than it would be in America. And if you made it in Europe, you were instantly globally marketable. Uh, and that attracted me. And so I realized I wanted to go to Europe and work in fashion in Europe. And I did that in 1990. Who brought you to Gucci? Don Mello, a mutual friend of ours, who's a wonderful woman and a great friend. And uh, not only did she bring me to Gucci, she taught me a lot. And uh, working with her for four years, I think, was one of the, uh, I mean, really has helped me incredibly. Which brought me to this point, it seems to me, that you can really luck out if you are at a place where because things are changing, where you're under siege, where there is a tottering possibility of bankruptcy, and they don't have a lot of designers around, totally. and you have to do everything. Yeah. And if you do everything, and if you're alert, and if you work 24 hours a day, you get a hands-on experience mm. that will provide extraordinary exponential benefits. So much of it is luck. It really is luck, because uh, when Investcorp... When preparation meets luck. Well, you have to be ready to take, you have to be ready for those moments, those lucky moments to cross your path. And you have to, know, you have to seize them. Yeah. Um, I think everyone has them in life, and you just have to jump on them. And, uh, but anyway. You recognize them first. You have to recognize them, them and you have to, you know, you have to jump on them. Yeah. Uh, and in 1994, when Investcor took control of the company, the company was in such bad financial shape that they weren't even looking at me. They didn't care what I designed, you know, whatever, fine, Tom's here, great, well, whatever. You know, it was... So I had this moment to basically do whatever I wanted and do what I thought was right. And I took it. Yeah. And you were handling about 11 product lines at that time. We, did have, we do still have 11 product lines, yes. And so you were designing all of them? I had one assistant left who, uh, you know, is great <laughs> yes. uh, and is still, still works with me and is, is amazing and is also a big key to, uh, you know, the whole thing. I mean, has been there with me for a long time. Uh, but, but, yeah. When, when was the breakthrough for you at Gucci? Uh, 1995, I think. My first season, you know, on my own without, uh, you know, really trying to figure out what I thought Gucci should be. It wasn't such a success. It wasn't really the right thing. It took me, uh, you know, a season to really think, uh, you know, what should this be? And to get it uh, moving. Those who write about you say that what you did, and even people who wear the products say, what you did it was this notion of retro design mm -hmm. and giving it a modern look. What do they mean by that? Retro. I mean, you know, I've been accused of being a retro designer, well, for the last five years at least. Uh, and, you know, all I can say is that I think as a fashion designer, what you have to do is try to be a part of your time. You have to keep your eyes open, look at everything that's uh, happening around you. You have to sense it and you have to become a part of it. And for whatever reason, I don't know whether it's because my generation grew up with all these television, you know, well, your generation too as well, but, uh, you know, my generation's a little cynical, uh, or at least I'm a little cynical, but most people I know, most of my friends are a little cynical, and this, this, it, it, it is retro to a certain extent. There certainly are retro influences, uh, you know, that have happened cross-culturally, by the way. This is not just fashion. Um, anyway, I'm getting off the track, but you have to sort of sense this and then, and then turn it into fashion, turn it into a thing. And that's what's been in the air for the last five years. And it hasn't just been in fashion, it's been in architecture. I mean, there's been a resurgence of, of mid-century modern architecture, furniture design. You know, you open a, a catalog today from any catalog company in the world, and there's a, a, a womb chair, you know, a, a Saarinen table, uh, an Eames uh, chair. Uh, you know, so it isn't just, it wasn't just fashion. Uh, it's also happened in music, it's happened uh, in art, it's happened uh, in culture. At what period that you know about are you most comfortable? What period? What do you mean? What well, period in history? Yeah, period in history. Would it be the 40s, the 50s, the no, 60s, No, it would the probably 70s, be the 80? 60s and the 70s. And I think, and it's funny because older designers, uh, uh, older designers, but uh, some other designers that uh, are my contemporaries, not in age, but in, in uh, you know, are, have been heavily influenced by the 30s and the 40s. Yeah. And I think really most people are influenced throughout their life by their very first images of beauty. So as a child, I was born in the 60s. You know, the 60s and the 70s were when I very first started seeing mm. women that I thought, wow, she looks amazing, or whoa, this is a great apartment, or this is really a beautiful table, or, you know, God, look at that car. And, and those images stick with you. They form the basis of your, your taste. And I think that it's very hard 
I mean, yeah, you could break out of it, and you know, we can all love what happens in the 80s and the 90s, and I hope the next decade, and the next decade, and the next decade. But deep down inside the the aesthetics of that that era that you came into the world, and I think you carry with you in some way. I mean, my first images of beauty, and most people's are probably you know their mother bending over them in a yeah. crib, and you think, wow, she, you know, I, it's my mother, and it's you know, or. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? I, I mean, do, of course I do. And, uh, you know, other designers, Yves Saint Laurent, for example, I mean, m much of what Yves Saint Laurent has always done has been very much about the 30s and the 40s, and I'm not trying to speak for him, which, by the way, uh, the 70s were very much about the 30s and the right. 40s. You know, yes, I'm a retro designer, I suppose, but all of us living in the 90s have been and are, uh, and, uh, you know, we're looking back at the 70s, but the 70s were looking back at the 30s, and the 30s were looking, you know, it's about having a sense of history. Each time we put our own stamp on it. You know, the, the, the mod period of 1995 doesn't really look anything like the mod period of the early 60s. You'll never confuse the two when you look back 50 years from now in a, in a book. Uh, you know, each generation, each, you know, you take it and you twist it, you change it a little bit, and it's got a definite stamp of that era, that moment in time. You, people who know you well say that you have this genius for understanding where pop culture is. Let's assume for the moment that's true. Thank you. That's nice. <laughs> well, let's do it. Where does it come from? I mean, does it come from you read all the time, you're out talking to people all the time, you somehow, part of your gift is that you are more alert to the stimuli that is out there? It's a puzzle. You know, everything that's going to happen next, the clues for it are here now. Exactly. They're in our culture now. It's all happening now. What will prompt what happens next? So you just have to look for it. You have to make it your job to find it. You have to, luckily, and, and this is a horrible thing, but as a kid, my mother was always saying, you know, I'm so sick of you telling me you're bored. You know, you're bored, you're bored. You're bored. You know, but it's worked for me in, in a sense. I've made a career out of it because it's my job to become bored and tired of everything. So you're looking for something before. else? Yeah, because that's the first key is knowing, you know what, I don't want to see this anymore. I'm really tired of this. <laughs> all right, well, now what do I want to see? You know, I've been looking at blue, you know, gee, let me look at everything else, and all of a sudden yellow looks great to you. And you think, you know, that looks really good. Because that looks it's great. Fresh, because it's new. And because your eye's ready for it. Because, you know, the right thing at the right time is the right thing. The right thing at the wrong time is the wrong thing. So, you know, it's got to be the thing that people want before they know they want it. So to figure that out, you have to figure out what they don't want. Okay, but how does that happen is really my question. You try to look at everything, you try you to see everything, you try read to read. every magazine, you do all the... Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> I get, you know, literally hundreds of magazines every... And I don't sit and read every article, I don't have time. You know, you skim them, it's like speed reading, and yeah. you're trying to just fill your brain and with stuff. And images connect, and therefore they... Yeah, you know, you try to fill your brain with stuff, and then all of a sudden you think, God, I'm so <laughs> sick of seeing this stuff, I don't want to see this anymore. And you, you throw it away, and you think, well... What do I want to see now? What do I want there, to see? And that's when you have to look inside, and you have to, part of it is intuitive, and you have to think, I want to see this. And, you know, you're putting yourself on the line. There is this story about you that you sent <clears throat> some of your design assistants. said, go into Target stores. That's true. Go into Target stores yeah, yeah. and see what makes you laugh and see what grabs your attention. Mm -hmm. And figure out why. And How did figure you hear out... that story? <laughs> How we did know. you hear that story? Well, we, we talked to those that people. That's really wild. <laughs> and then figure out what it is they say, mm. you said, what it is that makes you laugh, and then how do we convert it into fashion? Well, what this actually was was for uh, our home collection, our gift yeah. department. Um, and, I mean, you can find your inspiration anywhere. Uh, you know, I mean, you can, you can find it anywhere. What happens then? Suppose you're inspired. I mean, let's go back to fashion, women's clothes. And, and Target, by the way, and all those kinds of stores fascinate me endlessly. Me too. Because, of course, in Europe, we don't have those. And I well, they're coming, though. Time I mean, Europe, Walmart's coming, coming, I know. No, they're coming. But it's usually one of the first things I do when I get to America is to go to some giant, you know, <laughs> supermarket or thing. And just, I'm just stunned by, yeah. and, and it changes so fast. You know, I'm here, you know, once a month, but it, it even moves that quickly, well, you know. And, the genius of those people was that not only the genius of those people was the fact that they a they computerized early. Mm. They knew what was selling. They knew as soon as it was going off Absolutely. the racks. They figured it out at the end of the day or during the day, and were able to either to order that which was mm -hmm. hot, mm -hmm. not order any more of the stuff that was not hot, mm -hmm. and then keep looking and keep replenishing. I mean, the speed, speed. of delivery speed. between the marketplace, speed. you know, and the creation has just gotten tighter yeah. and tighter and tighter. And more and more important. And yeah. more and more important. What is it that you do when, I mean, all these ideas are there. I mean, you sit at design meetings mm -hmm. and say, okay, we got handbags, we got shoes, we got dresses, 
we got home furnishings, we got whatever. And we got a responsibility to either satisfy the consumer or lead the consumer. Yes, that's basically what I do. But it's not quite as dry as that. You know, I have, I mean, are you asking me, like, what is my yeah, daily? Right. What is your day? What, what is do? my day? Okay. My day varies from day to day. Uh, but uh, a normal week would maybe be an easier thing. Maybe two days of that week I'm working on product. I go from product category to product category. I'll have shoes in the morning at, you know, 8, and then something else at 10, and something else at 11, and blah, 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 blah. And I move from category to category. I work with the design team. I say, look, I think we should do this. This really worked well last season. This didn't work. I'm tired of seeing this. Let's do that. Um, blah, blah, blah. I'll look at some things. Change them. Uh, let's see this in yellow. Let's see it in blue. Let's change the heel. Da, da, da. Go to the next product. Uh, the way we work, and I know it's hard. I'm probably not explaining this properly because, of course, for me, it, it's just second nature. Um, the way we work is, you know, you have to be able to think of what you want to see. You have to be able to draw it or communicate it to someone who can make it. They then make it for you. They bring it back to you. You look at it. You change it. Perfect it. Send it back. It comes back. Send it back. It comes back. Send it back. It comes back. Four or five times until you have the finished product. Right. Once you have that, then you price it. You sell it. And then you manufacture it. And sometimes you have to make some slight uh, modifications to make it be easier to manufacture. Here's That's the, the design part okay. of it. Here's what I'm getting at. We're going to see three minutes of your spring 2000 women's and men's collection. Yes. This took place recently. Uh, yes, spring. When was that? October for women's, actually end of September, and it would have been in July for men's. Uh, spring 2000. So it was, right. it was July for you. Uh, July for men's, uh, September for women's. All right. Take a look at this. Be before we look at this, mm -hmm. um, when we see this, have you, how many times do you see it on a model before it makes its way I spend, to the runway where yeah. the buyers and the fashion press see it? I fit and work on these clothes for three or four months before we actually start working on the show. Then when we're working on the show, for about ten days, I try every possible combination. Because we show 50 outfits. I like to show a very short, concise thing. You have 20 minutes to convince the world of your way. Right. And so it's concise. Uh, but there are hundreds of outfits behind these that are in the showroom that I, you know, you try this pant with that shirt, you Polaroid it, you try that with that, you Polaroid it, you try that with that, you Polaroid it. You do this for days and for days. You know, this jacket's great, but it'd be better like this. Let's take the sleeves off. Let's make the sleeves skinny. This doesn't work because her legs need color. Let's get some colored legs. Let's raise her up. Now she's too, let's change the shoe. Let's right. do, and you do this and you Polaroid it and Polaroid hundreds and hundreds of Polaroids. And then, you think, all right, what is my message this season? What do I want to say? And you edit those Polaroids, just like you're editing a film, uh, because you, you, know, you need to get the audience in, boom. You have to hit them on those first three outfits. They have to know what you're all about that season. Then you have to take them through. You have to make them think, wow. You know, you have to, once you've sold them on your initial idea, then you have to show them the subtleties of it. You have to let them see the fabric. You have to let them see uh, you know, the cut, the shape, the color. Uh, and then you have to, you know, you sort of take them up like this. You do it with music as well. And then you have to finish with something equally strong that reinforces and drives home your idea. So it's something that's very choreographed and very worked out. Then you have fittings. Once you've done that and you've decided these are the 50 things I'm showing or 45 things I'm showing, you have the girls come up. Yeah. They try them on. You fit everything to them. You change them around because some people look good in some things and yeah. some people don't look good in some things. You fit everything. You make every. I mean, then we rehearse them. We walk the girls. We videotape it. We film it. We look at it. You know, it's a, it's 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 not. You know, a lot of people think you're just throwing clothes on girls back there, and they're just coming out looking that way. It, it's not what happens. The devil is in the details, and the opportunity is in the details. For you, for you, the designer is the great moment, the most exhilarating moment, when they walk on stage and you get the response, and then you come on stage at the end, or is it way back earlier? when you had the brilliant idea to do whatever it is you wanted to do, or whether you had the concept that, uh, that this is what spring 2000 is going to be it's for us. It's both of those. The first moment usually happens at 3 in the morning with a box of cookies and a big bottle of Coke <laughs> and my Walkman on. <laughs> yes. And you think, yes, that's, 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 it. that's it, that's it, that's it, that's it. But you can be wrong. You can be totally wrong. The next moment, you know, after you've worked, you can wake up the next morning and you think, what was I thinking? This is horrible. Uh, the next moment, you, you put the whole thing together. Yes, it's a great moment when you think, God, it worked. It absolutely worked. It was right. But it is so fleeting because literally the moment I turn my back and walk off, especially if it was a, a big hit, you think, oh, now what am I going to do? Now what am I going to do? You know, now what? 
Uh, so it's, you know, there, there are a lot of great moments. I mean, they're... Right. And you do that for a bunch of products, not just women's fashion. You do, fashion. but it's, it's funny. No matter how hard you work, women's fashion, I have a friend who always says, you know, everyone judges you on the women's fashion. I mean, it, it, it is the most visible and changes the most. And, and really the whole worth of the brand, to a certain extent, hinges on the success of the women's collection. Even though most of our sales, for example, are done in handbags and shoes. Fashion is a big part of our business. But the real core of our sales is leather goods. It's a kind of, but, 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 but everyone women's judges. fashion is a defining yes. moment. Is this part of the reason, part of the reason that you, that Yves Saint Laurent is such a hero for you? Oh, Yves Saint Laurent really uh, is responsible for the way that modern women dress. And it really hasn't changed. I mean, he really put women in pants, uh, made women sexy in a modern way. I mean, women had worn pants before Yves Saint Laurent put them in, in a pants suit, but not, you know, it hadn't really been accepted. And women wouldn't have worn pants in the evening and pants to the office and, you know, uh, really invented the way of modern dressing for women. And it hasn't changed so much since More then. about him in a minute. Roll tape. This is three minutes of Gucci's Spring 2000 Women's and Men's Collection. And if it has no video, we'll talk over it. Here it is. Why is black such a big deal? Black, you know, for me, black is important because I like shape, right? And when you have black, you've taken everything else away. Color can really distract you. Color can, uh, color can distract you. Yeah. How important are the models in presenting this stuff? Models are very important, uh, but they're professionals, and uh, you know that's why they exist. Uh, they know how to walk. They know how to move. They have amazing bodies, uh, beautiful faces. Uh, but more than that, they have a presence. And a good model, especially in a runway presentation has a real presence. It's mm -hmm. like an actor. You have to project. You know, when they walk out on that runway, you know, you have to like think, wow. Wow. And that makes it easier because, of course, you know, any type of clothing looks better on someone that's beautiful. So it helps sell your product. Who determines whether this collection we're seeing mm. is going to be successful? In the end, it's whether people buy. In but the end, it's whether people buy. whether people buy. Well, most of our business is done through our own stores, so our buyers uh, control that. And I have had collections that were maybe not as strong uh, in the press, maybe not my best press collection, but that have been the best sellers. Why is so that? In the end, well, it's because they're looking for two different things. As I just said, black continues to be one of our number one selling colors. Editorially, no one wants to shoot black right now. And that's changing. I mean, we're selling more and more color and less and less black. Uh, what you see on the runway is sometimes an exaggerated, enhanced version of real life that gets the idea across. You may go in and buy something a little more basic, a little simpler, which would not get a good review on the runway because it wouldn't push fashion forward. It wouldn't move it forward. It wouldn't change the way people think about clothes. So they're, they're, they're not two different things. They work hand in hand, but they, there is a certain different side to what's successful editorially and what is successful uh, in terms of sales. Although for us, our editorial things have consistently been some of the best sellers. One of the trends that... Because you try to create an icon for a season with, with that. In New York, you're on Fifth Avenue. Yes. I mean, you're on 57th Street. We're on 57th Street temporarily. We're renovating our yeah. store on Fifth Avenue. Yeah. One of the things that I have noticed recently, and anybody who looks has noticed recently, is that all you see are these emporiums <laughs> being built along Madison Avenue. Mm -hmm. And there are Armani stores and Gucci stores mm -hmm. and... Donna Karen stores mm -hmm. and Ralph Lauren has been up on, Park, on Madison Avenue for a long time. Mm -hmm. uh, what's that about? Is it that, that the merchandising and owning your own stores is crucial to oh, what happens? It's so important because you can control everything. You can control the experience of the customer from the moment they walk in the door. You can control it with the architecture, the person who opens the door, who greets them, the music, the kind of service they get, the way the product is presented, the way it goes into the box and gets tied up with a bow the personal relationship that you develop with someone who's selling. And when you're selling luxury goods, that's very important. You know, the store managers in our stores send notes to all the clients. I mean, you know, you'll get a handwritten note. We've got a great suit for you, Mrs. Smith. You know, I know you like white. It just came in, blah, blah, blah. And you don't find that in the world today. I mean, that personal service is so important. Uh, so you can control all of that. And that's, that's really why I think you see so many people uh, taking back or so much of their business. Tell me where you want to take Gucci, you and and your business side? Well, it's funny because obviously I think about Gucci a lot. At this point, I'm thinking also about 
all the other brands that we're in the process of, of putting together. So I'm thinking of where we want to take Gucci Group, which is a bigger question than where we want to take Gucci. Uh, Gucci, I think, still has quite a bit that could be developed. Uh, I think our business can grow substantially. Um, I'd like to just see uh, each of our businesses uh, really take more market share. That sounds like a horrible thing to say. But our men's business, for example, is one of our fastest growing businesses and yet is still uh, not one of the, the biggest businesses, uh, men's luxury businesses in the world, and I think it could be. But what we see in the media business mm -hmm. is well, everything. It's a trend all over the world. Is, and what is you see in the fashion business is the same thing. I mean, will it's we see more and more of that? Over. You, you will see more and more of it. The, the key to its success will be that the consumer doesn't perceive it, because the important thing will be that each of these brands have their own personality. That Gucci does not look like YSL. Gucci doesn't look like Yves Saint Laurent, or look like Sergio Rossi, or look like you know. Each of these brands needs to have their own personality, uh, and if all of us, and by all of us I mean LVMH and Prada, and all of us can accomplish that, then it will all work. The Be reason success. I ask you what your plans were for the company is that at some point, Tom Ford will say, um, I have reached a point where I no longer want to design. Mm -hmm. I want to be the guy that's going to make a different kind of decision. Mm -hmm. When will that come for you? It won't come immediately. There's still too many things I want to do as a designer. But I don't think it'll come, you know, never say, never, never, pretend you know what's going to happen. I could sit here and tell you that it might happen in five years, and then in five years I'll think, what was I thinking? I love this. I'm going to yeah. keep doing it. Um, but the business side, uh, and when I say business, I don't necessarily mean the numbers side of it, but the, the strategy of the fashion business excites me and interests me a great deal and is more and more part of my day and more and more something that I'm interested in. Uh, and there will come a time when I'll think, you know, I don't want to compete with these 22-year-olds who really have a cl better pulse on what's happening in fashion. Uh, I don't want to be struggling, you know, at a, a certain age thinking, God, you know, is this right? Is this right? When really I should step back and should, you know, so th that will happen. At some what's point. the biggest, what's the toughest thing about what you do? Oh, God, a lot of it's tough, but it, it uh, is constantly coming up Looking with... Looking for what's new. I'll, I'll tell you what it is. It's... It, you feel sometimes completely drained because you basically sell your personality to a certain extent. You know, I walk down the street sometimes and I see people with my haircut and my clothes. And I go into the Gucci store and I see my furniture because, you know, the furniture in the Gucci store came from my house. I thought, this is great. I love this look. We're going to do this. You know, this is going to be... You know, but you created you, that you, because yes, Tom Ford is what you are selling. You, you were in the end are selling Tom Ford created, even though their, that's the your name is not a label name. I'm selling a mix of Tom Ford and Gucci. Um, but you know, constantly you have to come up with these new things. So every day people come to you, what, do you, what should we do next? 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 What's, next? next What's this? Thing? What's that? What's that? And at the end of it all, you can feel almost like you've just been, you know, completely drained. And, and so that's the hardest thing is to constantly excite yourself enough to come back and say, okay, this is next. You know, this is next. This is next. This is next. Because it's, it's, it's exhausting. There is talk. You spend more and more time in Los Angeles. I love Los Angeles. What is it about Los Angeles that intrigues you? Los Angeles, well, there are many things about Los Angeles that intrigue me, but it is really one of the only completely 20th century cities, and now we're about to leave the 20th century, so maybe that won't be as important, uh, 20th century cities in the world. Uh, I love architecture. I think Los Angeles for residential architecture has got to be one of the most amazing cities. I mean, all the great 20th century architects uh, were working and really are responsible for the way Los Angeles looks. Aside from that, the film and entertainment industry is centered in Los Angeles. And whether we all know it, I mean, what I do as a fashion designer may be important in influencing fashion, but the most important thing is, is what's coming out of Los Angeles. Because everything I do is filtered through. Everything everyone does in the world gets filtered through Los Angeles or filtered through that business. Uh, you know, music videos, television, film, uh, everyone working on all of those uh, products. Why isn't, I know you believe that, but why isn't that as much true for New York? Because VH1 is here, it and is MTV true. is here, but and these tele television has much as as powerful influence, if not more. You've lived in you've lived in New York a yes. long time, and, and I lived here well for about twelve years at one point. But I've spent a lot of time in New York, and New York has become a very Los Angelesized in this big sense. Now, really, the beauty standard, you know, the beauty standard in the world today is blonde streaks in your hair, um, you know, 
everything's all pushed up. It's, yeah. it's a very L.A. beauty standard. I mean, in London, where I spend a lot of time, the women look more and more like women in Los Angeles because Los Angeles is that filter that everything's going through. And then those images are being broadcast all over the world, and young girls everywhere are seeing you know, right, but let me argue trying, the point, though. Well, you you can argue it, and we can argue it. And New York <laughs> is you clearly see the fashion important. magazines come out of New York. It's true. And it's those true. are the magazines and where you see And who is on the cover of all these fashion magazines lately? Movie stars. Exactly. And the movie stars, now, rather than models, are the most influential exactly. factor. Exactly. And those are the people that you, in a sense, trying to develop these cozy relationships exactly. with. Exactly. Like Rita Wilson, you mentioned. And I love Rita. Yes, she's yes, wonderful. Who, you know, Tom Hanks, she's an actress, right. and Tom Hanks' wife. Right. And people like Madonna. Yeah. And people like... So I'm not saying Los Angeles is responsible. I mean, to put, you know, in today's world, to attach any city to any, you know, media is a broad thing. It happens everywhere. It happens all over Europe. I mean, you know, New York is important. London is important. Paris is important. But it's for you, important. right now, My, it's Los Angeles. Well, but that's a personal thing. Uh, as I said, I like the architecture. Yeah. I love... Hollywood. Yeah. I love that. I mean, I what is love it you love that, about Hollywood? That, that, and people in Hollywood aren't going to like this, but I love, you know, it's on the edge of vulgarity. <laughs> yes. And I love that. It's and tacky, I, you once it's said. It's tacky. And gaudy. And gaudy, but I love that. There's great beauty in tacky and gaudy. Well, that's exactly uh, part of I what think. your success is. You found what the beauty was in tacky and gaudy. Well, and one of the beautiful Isn't things not? about, yes, and one of the beautiful things about style in Los Angeles, or style, more than Los Angeles, maybe style in Las Vegas, yeah. is that you have something that has been created by the people you know people come to these places to make their success so when they make their success they sort of shed the baggage of wherever they came from and right. and they take on you know they, they I'm not explaining yes you are you're well. doing fine uh, anyway uh, create anyway, their own style so to speak which which can be often quite original yeah. does that mean that the fashion business is moving more so to America no, than it is I, to Milan well, and from Milan and all those other the places. Certainly, American culture is really slowly taking over the world. And Europeans won't necessarily like that, but I mean, it's true. And the I French mean, will like it least of all. Least of all, but it's true. American culture, uh, even if things are, you know, even if creative things are coming out of Europe, they're quite American-style products. Uh, and by products, I mean even you know, video and film and television and, and, and everything. Uh, how much of the draw of Los Angeles is the fact that somehow in the back of Tom Ford's mind is that he may decide, having done everything that he ha can do at Gucci, both in terms of strategic planning and design and running a, you know, a, a multi-billion dollar company, what he would like to do now is to direct films, bring all of this sense of culture and style and, and feeling for the pulse of where young people are I think film is the ultimate design project, and I did say one time I'd love to direct a film, and I probably shouldn't have said it because, of course, I have no experience directing. No, 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 that's I not don't know anything point. about it. But it's fascinating because what I do in terms of design, the you real have creative an agent part, from one of the largest agents. He's a friend. He's not really my agent, Brian Ward. But uh, anyway, um, <laughs> he's a friend, he's a, pers a good personal friend, and I'm too busy to he's looking you know, at projects for you. Come on. No, but uh, <laughs> anyway, I'm quite involved in what I'm doing at the moment, yeah. and it's taking all my time. What was I going to say? Well, you were going to say about directing me? at some point, oh. because film well, because is the film ultimate is the medium ultimate, for you. Well, it's the ultimate design project, in a sense, and it lasts music. forever. It has music, it has, well, it has costumes, more than that. You design it has a world. Design. No, you design a world. You design these people. You design what they do, what they say, whether they live, whether they die. You design a little world that's locked in a bubble, and it can never change, and it, the ending is always the same, no matter how many times you watch that video. Nothing ever happens. You know, and uh, living in Europe, I often come home at night, and, you know, if I'm tired and I don't want to listen to French television or Italian television, I'll pop in a video. And boom, 1939, there's this world. You're laughing, you're responding to these people as if they were alive today. And that, it, it lasts forever. It, it really is, uh, so I think that must be very satisfying. Fashion is over the moment the woman leaves the room. And the next time you see this person in the same dress that excited you the very first time you saw it, it's not the same, you've seen it before. And you see it in a museum 20 years later and it's on a, you know, it, see, it doesn't I capture the moment, because that's what it's about. It's about a moment, and it's very fleeting. See, I can hear you in the future saying, all of my life has prepared me for this moment to direct a film. All the things that you have done, you could say, you know, you, go, you can always have cinematographers and others come with a good script. You can get involved in projects. I would be something I'd be incredibly interested in, but not anything I'm interested in in the 
near future. I've made a commitment to being where I am. I love what I do. And there's still a lot to do here. Uh, from a design standpoint, mm -hmm. where are we headed as we go wow. into this next century? Everything that we've done in the 90s is just, it's finished. It's over. And I really feel that. And I don't feel it just because we're hitting this year 2000. But you just feel the end of the cycle. Um, and, and that's over. Where it's going next, I don't know yet. And I hope I figure that out. Uh, there are lots of directions fashion will go. As I said, it will, it will depend on where life goes. It will depend on what's happening with the economy because, you know, the rich are getting richer and the poor are getting poorer. Uh, and who knows? I mean, 50 years from now, we could be living in a world like the 18th century where fashion reaches absurd heights in small little pockets yeah. of civilized society where you're, you know, jumping by plane from pocket to pocket and in between is just, you know, a wasteland. I mean, are, who knows? Are there moments in which you think say to yourself, and there was, it is said, this story when you went back to your mother's or your grandmother's home mm -hmm. in Santa Fe. Mm -hmm. and you're just going through things, things that I had to do as well, you know, after my mother died. And you're realizing how many things that they had. Oh, yeah. Are there moments building on that idea mm -hmm. in which you say, this is, this is silly. Oh, yeah. This is all There are a lot silly. of moments where it makes me sick, the amount of stuff, the amount yeah. of things. Uh, and all really you're doing is creating a taste more, for more things, a know, taste for more things, know, and more know, things, and more things. I know. And you're right. And, you know, we may have a real backlash against all of this. Uh, and, again, if we do, it will be, because people still need things. You know, I still need a glass to hold this water in. And if it's a beautiful glass, it enhances my life, because drinking out of it is a different experience than drinking out of a paper cup. Sure is. It is. It's different. It adds texture to your life. So we're still going to need these things. But there may be a real backlash. And we may become much more conscious of, you know, less waste. And, and, and if we do, and this sounds like a really sick thing to say, but it will be our job or the job of the luxury industry to, to adapt to that. You know, trends change, fashion changes. Right now we're in an extreme over-the-top mode. Clearly that's going to swing back. And we're going to have whatever the new version is of what happened in the early 90s after the stock crash in the 80s. It's sort of pared down. You know, I'm not saying we're going to that because it'll be different this time. But clearly we will have that. Who has influenced you the most? Did obviously your mother had a significant influence. My mother, my grandma, my, my parents, my father. I mean, I had, I had great, you know, as a kid growing up, like a lot of people probably think, oh God, you know, I hate this, I hate that, I'm not happy, I want this, I want to move to New York, I don't want to live here in, in Santa Fe, New Mexico, you know, I want this, I want that. Looking back at it, I had the most amazing childhood. I had probably one of the most perfect childhoods of anyone I know. I had two parents that loved me and supported anything that I wanted to do and, and really gave me so much and everything I have in life I owe to them and to what they, you know, instilled they in me They made you believe kid. in yourself or gave you confidence? They that gave me so much. They gave me, uh, you know, uh, a moral sense and by moral I don't mean anything to do with sexual or, you know, I'm talking about sort of a, a real sort of solid sense of myself as a person. They gave me confidence. They taught me how to to treat other people and to, uh, you know, how to react with other people and, and what was important in life. And, and uh, I mean, I, I think about things that, you know, I can hear them. <laughs> it's like a broken record in my head often, but I had a wonderful childhood. And that, you know, I am so lucky, and, and a lot of people don't have that. And uh, it gave me a foundation. You weren't an athlete. In high school. <laughs> By high school, I was an athlete. <laughs> wait, wait, wait. In, early in sort of, period. In sort of, you know, eighth, eighth, by the time I was in the eighth grade, I became an athlete. Yeah, when I was younger, I had asthma. I was sort of, you know, I would rather stay home and rearrange the furniture than play football. It's true. Uh, by the time I was uh, maybe 12 or 13, I was playing tennis and skiing a lot. I was on the ski team in, in, in high school and yeah. tennis team, and I was more athletic and uh, had sort of whatever. Do you ever dream that it would end up like this? Did you know? Did you, know, you sense that you would somehow make a difference? Well, I don't know whether I've made a difference. That's, a, you know, doctors and... Within and your own realm. People you doing, have. you know, there are a lot of people doing more important things. Well, that's, no, it's not a, it's not a no. No comparison. But, it's a question. Yeah, I felt an incredible sense of drive to accomplish something. Maybe it wasn't so focused as a kid. I didn't know exactly what it was going to be. I knew, you know, I wanted to, I wanted to do something. And, and I, I've always had a, a great sense of drive. Even Nobel laureates who've come to this program, not one has said the reason I achieved so much was because I was smarter than everybody else. Mm -mm. They all say it was because I had drive, energy, and wanted it more. And maybe I was naive. 
but going, maybe I'm still naive, you know? Th th that ability to say, oh, I can do that, you know, sometimes is quite foolish. And if you're smart, you think, I can't do that. I don't know anything about that. What, what the hell, what am I thinking? But that drive can, you know, it is, it's drive, as you just said. I mean, the drive can sort of overcome that, and you can learn and figure it out. Things that you might looking, that's why I think, you know, so many people, it's your, oh, this sounds silly, I'm not even going to say no, it. No, say it. Go ahead. Well, I was going to say it's your youth, but of course, clearly, I'm still in my youth. But even looking back now at what I was doing in my 20s, I'm not sure I would have had the, have the strength now to do some of the things that I did earlier on, because I was kind of stupid and naive, and had I not, you know, had I really known what I was getting into, I would have said, <laughs> or if you, knew. you know, you shouldn't, you shouldn't do yeah. this, and, and probably 20 years from now, I hope I'll look back even at now and, and say the same thing. For Is, you have said, I mean, it, you know, it made, you've been announced that you were a gay man for, in the press, um, and have a relationship with a uh, journalist that lives mm -hmm. in Paris, mm -hmm. uh, but you have said, and you're, you have said that if I chose ten words to describe me, mm -hmm. gay would not be one of them. It wouldn't be. And, uh, you know, I don't even think about it. It's not even a question of gay and straight. It's just who I am. I don't even think about it. What ten um, words would come to mind when you oh would describe God, yourself? Oh, God, probably overbearing and... Uh, <laughs> driven. <laughs> you know, driven. Driven and, uh -huh. uh, you know, lots of things. Uh, but, but that isn't... And, and I hope that one day the world will be that way, you know. I mean, you meet people every day in your life, you know, you meet men, you meet women. You don't want to sleep with all of them, you don't want to have a relationship with all of them. They're really people. And what you want to do is connect with them as a person. And so for me, it's just, it's just not even an issue. I, I really don't even think about it. You find it, it's an issue um, in your business at all? No, it's not an issue at all, and it's not an issue in the world that I live in. I never encounter, uh, you know, I never even think about it. Sometimes when I'm in a place, uh, uh, you know, not a major city, uh, I will all of a sudden realize, oh, you know, people think that, you know, that that's not okay, or, you know, and it's a shock to me always, because in the world uh, that I live in, I don't, uh, I don't even think about it. It's not even an issue. Let me come back to, to where your company is going. I, any news that you can make here with me today? About no, I'm whether, sorry. I wish there was, Charlie. I know what you're going to I can't. Uh, there's nothing that you're going to buy. Either nothing in terms of can, buying back some stock that, that somebody in the company, nothing, nothing you can, can tell me tell about, about without getting in trouble with the exactly. board of directors. Well, or maybe even <laughs> bigger boards than that, but no, nothing I can tell you about. Or is there something happening that I might want to know about? You might want to know about it, yeah. but uh, as I said, I can't. But really it's fair to say, it. it's fair to say. We're very actively pursuing lots yeah. of different options, yeah. We still have $2 billion. Uh, to invest. Because you used about, what, nine, a million, hundred million, or a million, billion about on the billion. SL. Yeah. Right. So you've got two billion dollars to invest, and you're mm -hmm. looking for investment. And we're looking for smart ways to invest it. Great to have you here. Thank you very much. It was great to be here. Tom Ford from Gucci for the hour. Thank you for joining us. See you next time. find millions of books online barnesandnoble.com over 70 million people are getting an education on the internet this year are you ready virtually all internet traffic travels across the systems of one company cisco systems empowering the internet generation dlj director is proud to underwrite charlie rose 
DLJ Direct, the thinking of a Wall Street investment bank, combined with the speed of the internet. Donaldson, Lufkin, and Jenrette, putting our reputation online. Charlie Rose is also made possible by these funders. And by Bloomberg, a provider of multimedia news and information services worldwide. To order Charlie Rose program transcripts and video cassettes, call 1-800-ALL-NEWS or write to the address on your screen. Please indicate show date and guest. This is PBS. Politicians, business leaders, scientists, authors, artists, the people who do know, the people you should know, tonight on Charlie Rose. Sets call 1 800 all new.